Amma, the Dalai Lama, Sri Sri, Sadhguru, Sri M, Eckhart Tolle, uh, Desmond Tutu. Um, and um, each of them in their own way has um, an incredible amount of power that they weld. You know, we think of post-traumatic stress disorder in the context of the military, but it also occurs with children. I mean, what is more horrible to to essentially not recognize your dignity as a human being, to diminish who you are by someone who knows nothing about who you are? And there's a book that's been quite popular. It sold 37 million copies, which is called The Secret. I don't know if Oh, yes, a Rhonda yeah. Byrne. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. The Secret is a book about I, I, I. Uh, look at this lady. She's 105, and she's a, a vegetarian. She exercises every day, et cetera, et cetera. And then he'll say, well, here's a man. He's well overweight. He doesn't exercise at all. He drinks whiskey every day, and he smokes cigars, and he's 105, too. Woof, woof. Welcome to Ghanacast. Today, I'm speaking to Dr. James R. Doty, MD. Dr. Doty is a neuroscientist, a neurosurgeon, a best-selling author, international speaker, a compassion researcher, and founder and director of the Stanford University Center for Compassion and Altruism. Dr. Doty, thank you so much for stepping into the Ghana studio. You've been on a whirlwind tour of Ghana, actually. You've been seeing all the different initiatives, and you've been at the Wellness Center, and uh, you've also experienced uh, heartfulness meditation. So let me start with that. How has your experience of heartfulness meditation, what was that like? Well, uh, in fact, actually, it's very similar to my own meditation. And uh, uh, I think that when you focus on the heart, which unfortunately so many people in the West do not do, uh, it's a different experience uh, because, uh, and we may f metaphorically say uh, compassion, if you will, is in the heart, but actually there's a lot of science that demonstrates that your heart has its own intelligence. and. Um, if you look at the vagus nerve, which arises in the brainstem, it is present uh, throughout uh, the entire body, all your major organs, but it's especially prominent in your heart. And it's a two-way street. So your heart can actually influence your brain and your emotional state and uh, vice versa. So in many ways, um, if you think about it, <clears throat> fundamentally the heartfulness practice is very powerful because while it may not explicitly say or know or it's been experientially determined, uh, I think that in fact is where the origin of compassion, love, kindness uh, originates. So do you think there's a lot more to learn about the heart scientifically or are we at a stage where we know pretty much what there is to know? There's a lot to know about everything that we don't know about. Uh, uh, I think one of the challenges for scientists is they always have to have humility. And uh, <clears throat> when you encounter something that's not explainable, um, it doesn't necessarily it's mean it's not based in science. But that being said, the fact that science can't explain it doesn't diminish the power of that event or experience. Absolutely, absolutely. There are more things between heaven and earth. I have read that somewhere. Yeah, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's old Bill, you know. Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you also met Daji in your time here. You had, and in fact, you're meeting him again after this uh, podcast. So, what was what was that meeting like? What was uh, meeting Daji like? Well. <clears throat> I've been blessed uh, because I've had the experience, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, I've been blessed because I've had the experience of meeting a number of, you could call them gurus, or I would prefer elevated spiritual beings. Um, and uh, including Amma, the Dalai Lama, Sri Sri, Sadhguru, Sri M, Eckhart Tolle, uh, Desmond Tutu, um, and 
um, each of them in their own way has um, an incredible amount of power that they weld. Now, they may weld it in different ways, but uh, I also have to say that in terms of my own sense of purity and elevation, uh, I think he's certainly uh, an extraordinary human being in that regard. And even though it's been a very short time, uh, I have great admiration for him. Absolutely. You mentioned about uh, the other great uh, leaders, spiritual leaders that you met, Thich Nhat Hanh, and uh, I mean, virtually a who's who of. Uh, what do you think it is that sets the, the uh, people apart? What do you think, is there a common thread running through these extraordinary individuals? Well, I would say that uh, when you meet an elevated spiritual being, uh, they live above their dogma. And what I mean by that is their connection doesn't necessarily relate to the dogma at all. These individuals in a microsecond can look at you and see, if you want to use the term, your heart. And when they see that, uh, that immediately causes a connection. And uh, what they are looking for is, are you non-judgmental? Are you accepting of others? Do you love? Are you compassionate? Are you kind? And again, like I said, uh, they can sense this immediately, but they can also sense if you're in need or if you have conflict or if um, there is something that is troubling you. And, uh, and that's also a, an extraordinary ability uh, to have. And I have to say, in general, uh, that's something that all of these individuals uh, carry or have, that ability. The other thing, as I mentioned, while certainly dogma is important in some situations, and there's a certain group of people who need the dogma to bound their behavior, mm -hmm. um, these individuals are non-judgmental. They are accepting and uh, they're not tied to the dogma per se. They don't judge you on whether you memorized all the sutras <laughs> or uh, the different, the Gita or uh, yeah. whatever it is. Because again, while it offers a framework and it uses allegory storytelling to teach, uh, again, uh, that's not necessary per se, and if you already yourself contain these. They don't judge you whatever your religion is. Again, they judge you on who you are and uh, the kindness, compassion, love uh, that you carry with you. And that's why they can accept anyone from any tradition because it's not about the dogma. It's about what's in your heart. So true. So true. And it's also interesting, uh, your backstory. I mean, I'm aware of it, but uh, I think a lot of our listeners would not be. I mean, uh, given, uh, given your childhood, it would, uh, you would consider, you, by your own admission, you consider it highly unlikely that you would be in the place where you are now, a neurosurgeon, also meeting the spiritual elevated beings all over the world. Something magical happened in your life at the age of 12, if I'm not mistaken. Can you briefly tell our listeners about that? Sure. Um, everyone has a backstory, uh, and uh, uh, and for many that backstory defines who they become, or how they act, or how they interact. And um, in my situation, I grew up in a challenging environment, and uh, my father was an alcoholic. My mother had had a stroke when I was a child. She was partially paralyzed. She had a seizure disorder and also uh, was chronically depressed. And in fact, she attempted suicide multiple times. Um, we were in poverty and uh, lived on public assistance. I had an older stepsister who was nine years older and, uh, and an older brother. My older stepsister left the house early because of course she did not want to be there in that troubling environment. And she got married very young. She dropped out of high school. My older brother, uh, he avoided conflict and he avoided um, situations uh, 
And as a result, the burden of caring in some ways for my parents uh, was placed on me uh, uh, very young. What we know uh, is that there's something called adverse childhood experiences. And there's now a system where you add up the numbers, if you will, related to uh, was there drug and alcohol abuse, uh, was there violence, uh, was there sexual or psychological uh, abuse, uh, were you in poverty, was there a mental illness. And you add those up, and the higher that number, uh, the less likely uh, you are to succeed in life. Now, the word succeed can have many definitions, but in a traditional sense, it means getting a job, supporting your family, sure. living in society, functioning in a normal way. And the baggage that you get from those experiences, in some ways, is uh, a constant state of trauma. You know, we think of post-traumatic stress disorder in the context of the military, but it also occurs with children. And as a result, you can never relax because you never know when something's going to happen because your life is chaotic. And so uh, when you're not able to focus, when you're not able to be present because you're waiting for something to happen, then it's very hard to focus and to learn. And unfortunately, uh, many children who, can, who are incredibly intelligent or who start out as the kindest, gentlest, nicest person, unfortunately give up and their lives are ruined. Uh, <clears throat> what was different for me, and, and I want to preface this, I never sensed that my parents did not care about me mm -hmm. or they did not love me. That really wasn't the issue. They just weren't available. And um, so what changed for me, though, was that <clears throat> I walked into a magic shop at the age of 12, and that seems very strange in some ways. I had had an interest in magic, and what would happen oftentimes if something was happening at my house, sometimes I, I would get on my bicycle and ride as far and as fast away as possible. And on one of those uh, journeys, I ended up far from my house in a strip mall, as we call it, with these gathering of these different stores uh, in a complex. And in that was a magic shop that I had never visited. And I walked in, and um, there was a woman there at the counter, and she was probably in her mid-50s. And I use the term Earth Mother. If you're from the 60s, you know what that means. Uh, uh, and she was wearing a blue muumuu. She had sort of grain hair. And she had glasses on the tip of her nose and a chain behind her. <laughs> <laughs> and she was reading this very thick paperback book. And uh, no one else, else was there. And she looked up. And she embraced me with this incredible smile. And, you know, for children in those types of environments, this idea of psychological safety is very, very important. And I just felt embraced by her. I felt safe, which then allowed me to feel it was okay to speak with her, to tell her the truth, to be authentic. And so she asked me a series of questions. And um, uh, you may ask why I was listening. And one of the reasons was because she was giving me uh, chocolate chip cookies. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Uh, yeah, because a 12-year-old has just that much of an attention span. Well, especially for my background. Uh, but anyway, we began talking. And it was interesting because one thing, too, is like so many other people who did, she did not look down on me in mm -hmm. the sense of it being a 12-year-old. Also, she didn't look down on me because I was poor. And, mm -hmm. I, and of course, she didn't know that. But by your dress... Uh, they can tell if you're sort of unkept, if you have uh, holes in your shoes. So you had felt judged before that. Oh, sure. of course. Well, I would suggest you were probably have all felt judged before. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, this led to us having a conversation. And, and she did ask me questions about my background, and I actually told her the truth. And after about 15 or 20 minutes, she said to me, she said, you know, I really like you. If you come in every day, I think I can teach you something that could really help you. And what she did was, <clears throat> and this was over a six-week period. I came in every day for six weeks. Wow. Now, I have to tell you, people say, well, oh, you must have known that there was something there for you or she could help you. And the fact of the matter was uh, I had absolutely nothing else to do, <laughs> and she gave me cookies, and I liked her. 
Uh, but I did show up every day. And uh, the first thing she taught me, which is a heartfulness practice, and uh, is a relaxation technique. Mm-hmm. Because I did not have the insight that I, my muscles were tense all the time. Uh, because of this sort of chronic trauma situation. And uh, as I said, if you're constantly stressed and anxious, you cannot focus or attend. So she taught me a relaxation technique, very similar to a heartfulness practice. And I practiced that for a period of time. And that allowed me to relax a bit. It allowed me to listen more clearly to her. And then she taught me uh, what we would call a mindfulness practice. Um, But it also included um, an understanding that the dialogue that I had going on in my head, which said, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, Mm -hmm. was not real. It was manufactured. And that was an incredible insight because I believed it. And unfortunately, what happens with many people, especially in that environment, you start listening to the dialogue, you believe it, and once you believe something, then it's real. And if it says you're not good enough, if it says you're not worthy, then you accept that. And this is the problem, unfortunately, with many people, is within each of us, we have this immense amount of power, but we give our agency away to that voice, or even to... And I'm sure you may have experienced, most people have, you have a dream, an aspiration of what you want to be, and you share it with people, and they go, you'll never do that. That's Mm, not possible. And nothing is more horrible than to get that from your parents, even. Um, So uh, she made me see that that was an illusion and that it was not truth. And it then allowed me to change the narrative Mm -hmm. from one of negativity to one of positive affirmation. Now, I would suggest to you the reality is you never get rid of that voice, uh, but you can also have enough awareness to not believe it either. Uh, But it, 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 almost everyone, it stays there. Uh, uh, But you can diminish its effect. You can have these positive affirmations. You can respond to that voice as soon as you hear it by stopping and saying, I am worthy, I deserve love. Mm -hmm. And once I was able to be kind to myself or to be self-compassionate, it allowed me to see the world through a different lens. Because when you're hypercritical of yourself, when you're beating yourself up, what it does is it clouds the lens of our perception. Sure. Because we become hypercritical of everything. We become judgmental. And um, so once I was free from that feeling, I looked at the world in a different way. As an example, with my parents, I no longer judged them. I realized that in their own way, they were suffering and they did not have the tools to deal with their own pain or to resolve that. And it wasn't their fault. So it allowed me to change my perception of being angry or hostile to one of acceptance and unconditional love towards them. But it also changed other things because, as you know, all of us give off a a type of energy. And if your energy is based on anger and hostility about your situation or envy or jealousy, uh, then people sense that. And so what she taught me was to let go of that. And I say that when I stop looking at the world a certain way, the world changed how it looked at me. Whoa. And so I realized that in fact, if you have the right attitude, if you're centered the right way, actually people want to help you. And so everything changed. And the other aspect that she taught me was a technique of manifestation. Now, here's where I will tell you I messed up. And what I mean by that is that manifestation can be very, very powerful. But I was 12 years old. And she asked me to write down what I wanted to manifest. But from the lens of a 12-year-old in poverty, it's it's an unfair thing to ask sometimes. 
And what I mean by that is that I was under the delusion that uh, if I was a millionaire uh, or if uh, I had a Rolex watch or if I drove a Porsche, these are three of the things on my list, <laughs> that that would somehow make everything okay. Mm -hmm. And um, now I would say that prior to that, I had, uh, in, my, in the fourth grade, I had a teacher visit the school on Professions Day, and it was a physician, a pediatrician. And this was, again, a person who recognized your dignity, looked at you eye to eye, was interested in what you had to say. And I was so impressed by him that he healed people that at that moment, I wanted to be a doctor. So that was also on, on the list. But again, the motivation for those things was about what I wanted me. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't pure in the sense that, and we can go into more depth about this, but you can manifest in that manner, but it's most powerful and is most likely to occur if your focus is on the other and being of service. That's incredible. So that it's like a built-in failsafe. Yes, in, in many ways. Uh, so the standard techniques uh, that often are uh, mentioned in books about uh, manifestation uh, are, you know, to visualize it, to write it down. And uh, she knew about these, and she had me do all of those. Mm -hmm. So I would, and the reality is when you use all your sensory organs, that it increases likelihood it gets embedded in your subconscious. So you write it down, you say it aloud, you visualize yourself in that position, and all of those reinforce that. And I have to say that uh, I did get everything on that list. Well, wow. uh, but uh, only later uh, did I realize that while I was always a good doctor uh, and really cared about people, my focus was on accomplishing things so that I would get external affirmation. Mm -hmm thinking that, well, if I climb this mountain, I'm at the top of the mountain, people are going to tell me how great I am and the sense of emptiness <clears throat> or uh, the sense of shame is going to go away. And it doesn't. And so... <clears throat> uh, so did you learn this after manifesting after, that or...? After. after. Mm. Um, but it brought me back down to reality. And ultimately, what happened is I went through a period of uh, great reflection. Uh, and I understood then that manifestation and our power really is within us, and only we can make ourselves happy. It is a gift we give ourselves. And that uh, was very powerful. And it was based on what, it wasn't about based on chasing things to get external affirmation. It was doing things, uh, being of service to others, which fulfills the emptiness that all of us have. And this is the problem in modern society because, unfortunately, Western capitalist society defines success as money, power, and position. And, unfortunately, it puts many people on the wrong path because they believe that once they have that, they're going to be happy. Mm -hmm. And the emptiness that all of us have that can only be filled by being of service to others, of con connecting with others, caring for others, they believe it's through having things. And unfortunately, so much of Western society believes that, that they look up to these people. No, the they, message is reinforced. Yes, yes. Media and and, and, and uh, so you see poor people, they, again, in some ways, what I did, uh, you know, I want to have a million dollars. I want to live in the mansion. And uh, it's a false narrative that only causes further pain and suffering. Uh, the way we evolved as a species is uh, to care for others. You know, we are one of the few species that when we're born, we have to be cared for. We don't swim off or run off into the forest. We have to be cared for for well over a decade. And that comes at a high cost of time and resources. Well, we are rewarded when we care. One, by stimulation of our reward and pleasure centers in our brain. And the other is the, uh, is the positive effect it has on our physiology. 
when you're kind, when you're compassionate, when you care. And, and this is when you shift from the threat mode or engagement of your sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic nervous system. Your heart rate uh, slows, your cardiac function improves, your blood pressure is lowered, your stress hormones are decreased, your um, immune system is boosted, the production of inflammatory proteins decreases, and, uh, and then this ultimately has effect on longevity. And in, you can also receive this, of course, from heartfulness practice. True. Because you're aligning yourself with how you were meant to be. And what happens is when you're born, you are a clean slate, if you will. You are empty. And unfortunately, the nature of society or living in this world um, gives one baggage oftentimes. And Conditions the, you. In a way. Yes, and, and the baggage you carry, unfortunately, if you don't have self-awareness, mm -hmm. Uh, impacts every decision you make, every relationship you have, how you react to things. And when you can learn to see through that, then in some ways you're liberated. And in fact, it's interesting that you start out emptying, which in some ways is the highest level of uh, elevation spiritually. You go through this journey where you're forced to deal with different events and you're tested, but when you die, you're liberated again into emptiness. Yeah, that's very interesting. I've thought about that also. You know, I think there's a quote by Bernard Shaw which says that an education is basically getting back to where you started, but knowing that place for the first time. And there's a, there's a book I read on swordsmanship from Japan which said that the ultimate level of swordsmanship is to become a novice again. You don't think about the technique. You go through this period where you're all technique and you know what it is and you know what to do, but the ultimate uh, swordsman does not think about that. It's, yes. It's a clean slate again. Yes. No, so that's exactly right. It's incredible. I wanted to ask you, you spoke about the negative self-talk sometimes that we can do with ourselves and which changed for you with that fantastic meeting. There is, there's also a... a on the opposite side, we could have a very inflated opinion of ourselves, which could be extremely harmful as well. And, uh, you know, many of us struggle with this, the negative self-talk, and then we're going the other way, the pendulum swings the other way, we're congratulating ourselves, we're, our ego is uh, out of control. You have developed personally something that I read about, a very uh, effective technique to kind of keep yourself grounded. Uh, and it... Uh, goes from the letter C to L. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Uh, sure. Uh, but uh, I will preface this by saying, again, we have to be able to recognize our delusions and our biases. And that's really hard. And uh, there is this ego that you're always fighting with that wants to be recognized as being important. And... Uh, I call it the alphabet of the heart. Um, and um, what happened was I, uh, and for those who haven't read the book, uh, hopefully you will, but um, I was very fortunate to get into medical school. Um, I was able to get into college, uh, but because I had a lot of struggles uh, and had to go home in various situations, my grade point average was quite low. Uh, of, you know, at least in the United States, the highest grade point average generally is four. And if you take extra courses, you can get up to 4.4, 4, 4.6. But generally, it's a 4.0. And the average to get into medical school at that time was 3.79. And my grade point average was 2.53. Wow. And in fact, uh, I did not even have enough credits to graduate. Uh, now, what's interesting, we were talking about people telling you what you can and cannot do and people believing them. So, of course, all my friends who were classmates who were pre-med students told me I would never go to medical school. Yeah, and they were not ill-intentioned. They were well-meaning. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's just that... Well, one, and uh, their egos told them they had higher grade point averages and they were smarter, so they had to inform me of that. 
But I think also that was uh, the reality for most people. But um, uh, the preface to the story about the alphabet of the heart is as follows. When I went to apply to medical school, um, we had to go through a pre-med committee, and they would have to write a letter for you. So when I went to get my appointment, uh, I went to the office and I asked the secretary to make me an appointment, and she refused. And uh, I asked her why, and she said, because it's a waste of everyone's time. Now, can you imagine as a human being somebody telling you that you're a waste of their time? I mean, what is more horrible to, to essentially not recognize your dignity as a human being, to diminish who you are by someone who knows nothing about who you are? So <clears throat> I informed this woman that I wasn't leaving until she gave me an appointment, and if she wanted to call security, <laughs> that was fine. So she did give me an appointment. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure you've seen the photographs uh, of Putin when he goes in a room and he's at one end of this massive long table. Yes, yes, and yes. then there are people sitting there. So what happened is I go for this interview and I walk in and there's this massive long table and there are these wow. three people at one end and here I am as a 20-year-old or whatever. So very intimidating. Other. Yeah, of course. And uh, the person in charge sitting in the middle, he has my file in his hand and he stands up. And he, he takes the file, picks it up, and throws it on the table. And he says, say what you have to say so we can get this over with. Oh, my. <laughs> I mean, what kind of people are they? <laughs> so anyway, so I looked at him, and I said to him, who gave you the right to destroy people's dreams? And I said, I'm not going to allow you to objectify me to a great point. Average. You know nothing about me. <clears throat> So I proceeded to lecture them for about 30 minutes. <laughs> and, uh, but at the end of it, they were all crying. You see? Well. Because if they have to look at your humanity, they cannot look away. Mm. And that's what I forced them to do. So uh, at the end of it, I ended up getting the highest level. Well. Wow. Of recommendation from these people. Wow. But that secretary, when I left, she had been in the room when this happened. She said, I want to give you this. And I said, what is this? She said, this is a program for socioeconomically disadvantaged students and minority students um, at Tulane University. And she said, I think this would be a perfect program for you. She said, but... <clears throat> The deadline has passed. And then she looks at me, she says, but I don't think that'll matter for you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I ended up calling the um, woman who headed the program. And she, in fact, did let me into the program. And so when I applied to medical school, I applied to one school. And that was Tulane. And I got accepted. And I got accepted with that 2.53 and not having a degree. Incredible. So. I had zero problems in medical school. And so, again, it shows you grade point average on some level has nothing to do with it. It's who you are as a person. Are you persistent? Do you care? Do you believe? And um, so fast forward a little bit, and I'll get to the alphabet of the heart. Uh, so imagine here I'm the least likely guy to be accepted. But if you fast forward 30 years or whatever, after Hurricane Katrina, the library was destroyed. They actually had to move the school to Houston, to Baylor, because they couldn't teach in the facility. Um, the dean uh, resigned, and they were recruiting a new dean, and they had a fellow from Harvard, but he wanted an endowed chair. Well, in American universities, I think in England as well, and other parts of the world, an endowed chair is the highest honor you can get from academia. Okay. There's a private donor who comes in, typically gives two to four to six million dollars, and that money from that endowment, then that person 
can use for whatever purpose for his research, for his lab sure, to pay sure. people. But that's considered the highest honor. So they were trying to recruit a new dean, and uh, I ended up funding the dean's chair. Wow. So the dean presently is the Doty professor. <laughs> I re incredible. rebuilt the library. I set up scholarships for socioeconomically disadvantaged students, yeah. and I set up some other uh, professorships. That's incredible. And I remain connected to the university because I'm extraordinarily grateful. I'm on the board of governors. And, uh, and in fact, they actually uh, recently named a lectureship after me, wow. which I gave the inaugural one, which is uh, the Doty Lectureship on Compassion and Medicine. And they're raising funds for a center, uh, the Doty Center for Compassion and Medicine. Incredible. And so, none of this would have happened if you had listened to that secretary and said, you're a waste of time. And absolutely. And this is the point, is that if you have a dream, if you have an aspiration, you need to hold on to that. It doesn't matter what anyone tells you. Mm -hmm. Because only you can decide. And if you accept what somebody tells you, it will never happen. So you have to persist. And uh, so. Uh, and on the other side, if you're in a position to tell somebody something, you have to be extremely careful about what you say to them. Well, this is a whole other discussion, is words matter, hmm. especially to a child. And I'll, I'll tell you a story about that after we get to the cat. Yes. Ca <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm enjoying the. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, uh, the alphabet of the heart. So what happened was, again, it was a very big honor for me to be asked to give the white coat ceremony lecture. And uh, in the United States and some other places in the world, before students actually start medical school, uh, they are given a white coat. They take the oath of Hippocrates or some other oath. And uh, then typically there's a, uh, and this of course is a self-serving statement, a uh, speaker who epitomizes the highest ideals of medicine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, I gave that lecture, but I was trying to uh, think, what is it I could give these students that would center them as physicians, but also as human beings? Mm -hmm. And I thought a great deal about this. And uh, in medical school, you're overwhelmed with information, so you, you use mnemonics to remember things. Um, so I created the alphabet of the heart, which is 10 letters. And it starts with uh, compassion uh, for self and others, recognizing the dignity of every person, practicing equanimity or evenness of temperament. Because, you know, our lives go through ups and downs. And, of Absolutely. course, everyone would want to be attached to the ups <laughs> where you acknowledge, where you've accomplished something. And it's incredibly, it feels incredibly good. The problem is it's transitory. And... If you're always clinging to that uh, or have attachment to that, you're going to be chronically unhappy. The other side of it, of course, is the downsides where some event has, where some event has occurred which is causing you pain. And of course, you don't want to have that experience. You want to avoid it. Unfortunately, some people believe they will never get over it. And of course, this leads to sometimes even suicide. But again, it's also, in most cases, transitory. And you don't want to get attached to that either. So it's being able to have an evenness of temperament where you can enjoy these things, but you're not attached to them. And it's also understanding that these down experiences oftentimes give you the greatest insights and wisdom in terms of who you are, what you're capable of. And sure. uh, they're to be valued. Uh, so that's equanimity. F is forgiveness, and I'm sure you appreciate the fact that, you know, people attach an emotion oftentimes when they feel somebody has hurt them, and it's a painful emotion, and they carry that with them. The problem, of course, is when you carry that emotion with you, every time you think of it, every time you interact with that person, it causes you suffering. And so you have to be able to forgive and it's not necessarily to say you forget, but you forgive them and you release yourself. Because when you carry negativity or anger or hostility towards someone, it's like you're drinking poison somehow thinking it's going to affect the other person. And, of course, mm. it never does. Mm. And so then there's gratitude, of course, and there's an immense amount of evidence that 
uh, having gratitude and thinking about what you're grateful for every day has a huge power to center you. Because as you know, half of the people in the world live on less than $2.50 a day. Sure. And I always say, when I reflect on uh, the situation with so many other people, no matter what my situation is, I am incredibly blessed and thankful. You know, as a neurosurgeon, I see people whose lives have been completely destroyed. As an example, uh, someone has a broken neck and is paralyzed from the neck down on a ventilator. Well, that, for many people, would be the absolute worst thing that could happen to them. Yet, you know, I talked to a young lady who's fallen off a roof and who's uh, 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 is paraplegic and not quadriplegic. And of course, mm. she's crying, saying, this has ruined my life. Well, I will wheel her to the room of the person who's on a ventilator at a quadriplegic. And I say, you are very fortunate. And you see, when you can see that contrast, it makes you understand that they're oftentimes people much worse off mm. than you are. Now, that doesn't mean that the person who's on a ventilator and quadriplegic cannot have a full life. Sure. But again, it's another level of challenge uh, for many people. Uh, so gratitude, humility. Um, did we do dignity? We did dignity. Oh, dignity okay. was right out to sea, right? Usually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, humility. Yeah. And, you know, the problem with so many of us is you can't care unless you can look at the person eye to eye hmm. and see them as an equal as a fellow traveler, a fellow human being. You know, when people get full of their ego and think they're particularly important, that in and of itself leads to ultimately unhappiness and frankly the inability to go beyond if you want to put in the context of a spiritual mm -hmm. level. As a physician or a neurosurgeon, I recognize that every p person in the hospital contributes to my success and healing the patient. So that includes the nurse, it includes the nurse assistant, it includes the person sweeping the floor, it includes the cafeteria worker, it includes the person who changes the bedpans. And I make sure that I acknowledge them. Because I am no important than anyone else. Mm. And every job is important. Uh, I is integrity uh, or having values that bound your behavior a set of rules you live by. J is justice, and I use that term in the context of our responsibility, those of us who are blessed to be here today. We have an obligation to care for those who are vulnerable. And of course, there's kindness. There does not have to be suffering uh, to be kind. It's simply the experience of a fellow human being and helping them, whatever that is. And then, of course, all of this is contained by love. So, That is beautiful. Now, people oftentimes ask me what my practice is. And, you know, we're talking about ego or humility. I find it always interesting where you meet somebody and they go, you know, I've done three Vipassana retreats in the last six months. Like, <laughs> why would I care? And I said, the very fact that you said something like that tells me you learned absolutely nothing. <laughs> okay. uh, so my practice, uh, what I do to center myself, is I wake up every morning. Now, I say every morning, so it's not true. It is not every morning. It is most mornings. I preface that because somebody goes, is that really you? Did it? So anyway, I don't know if you saw, there was a movie by Deepak Chopra's son, and he followed him around. Oh, video. No, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen it. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, follow them around. Of course, Deepak, I meditate every day. I do this. And so it shows him traveling somewhere, and, and his son comes in with the camera, and he's like laying in bed, like spread out, <laughs> snoring. It's like 9 o'clock in the morning. So that's why I preface it by saying, on most days, I am not a perfect uh, human being. Uh, but I wake Can up. Can we follow you around with the camera? Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Uh, but uh, I wake up every morning, and... Um, I sit and do a breathing exercise for a few minutes, and then I think of the awe and joy of living in this world, and then I go through the 10 letters of the alphabet, and that centers me for my day. And if it's particularly stressful or I'm anxious or some event occurs, I will stop for a minute or two and either go through the whole alphabet or focus 
on one letter. And this, I find, uh, is a way to center myself throughout the day. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about walking meditation. Mm -hmm. You know, when you practice these things, every moment is the opportunity to be centered and to um, uh, be calm. And we have that uh, within ourselves uh, wow. to do that. So. Wow. That's incredible. That's so beautiful. Well, you know, it's interesting is um, uh, Narin Kinney, who uh, is sitting over there. Yes, uh, yes. We <laughs> pretend he's not in the room. Yeah, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, he actually read my book, and uh, we became friends. But he introduced me to a young lady who her parents are heartfulness mm -hmm. uh, meditators, and uh, she is. Um, and she's incredibly intelligent. I think I met her when she was 16 years old. And she had organized a um, program uh, for teenagers with mental health and anxiety and things like this. And she came to me and she said, could you work with me to create a, um, an app? And I would like it to include the alphabet of the heart. And, uh, and we did that. And uh, so that's uh, available to everyone. But, uh, and what is the app called? Uh, AOTH, or Alphabet of the Heart. Wow. And, uh, uh, so it's out there, and uh, I get letters from people uh, who use it. Wow. Now, I'll tell you another story. Are we taking too much time? No, no, we're fine. We're fine. Right, okay. We'll pretend Karnakara isn't panicking in there. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, so, oh, because of we... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He can yeah, wait. Well, Don't, worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, uh, so, so, so what's interesting about that is a... Uh, about a month or two after I gave that lecture, I got, or after the book was published, I got an email from a woman. And she said, I am a person of faith. I um, am the spiritual director of the largest homeless shelter in the United States. And she said, I had become burned out at my job. People have sent, sent me prayers. Nothing impacted me, and I resigned. She said, I was given your book. And I read it, and the, and the alphabet of the heart so affected me, it gave me the strength to return to work. Wow. So long story short, um, her and I became friends. I actually flew down to the homeless shelter, toured the homeless shelter. Believe it or not, I gave a sermon in the church. We became friends. And a, a month or so later, she sends me another email, and she says, um, I told my best friend about how this impacted me, and she has a daughter who makes beads. She was 12, I think, at the time. Her name was Ginny. She said, Ginny made a set of uh, beads, each wooden bead representing a letter of the alphabet, and on her own she added a golden bead to represent the golden rule. Would you mind if we sold these as a fundraiser for the homeless shelter and the peace center that they had? And, I mean, what could I say? Uh, of course. So then... She shared with me that she had two heroes. One was the Dalai Lama, and the other was Desmond Tutu. And in fact, she shared the same birthday with Desmond Tutu. Wow. And um, so I was hosting the Dalai Lama at Stanford, and I called her up and I said, listen, I want to invite you to come and meet the Dalai Lama. Wow. So she says to me, she says, you know, I would love to, but I really have limited funds. And I said, well, listen, I want to hire you as a consultant. <laughs> Bring beads with you. You'll get to meet the Dalai Lama. We'll have him bless a bunch of beads, and you'll be set. So she came, met the Dalai Lama, and had this wonderful experience. Fast forward a number of years later, and I'm friends with Tutu, and it's his 85th birthday. And I had been at his 80th birthday party. And... Um, uh, so I w had been traveling, I was in Oslo, and I just decided I just did not have the energy to fly all the way down. But on the other hand, I was also doing it because I wanted to benefit her. So I called her, I said, I need you to do me a favor. You need to go to Cape Town and represent me. Wow. <laughs> at Tutu's birthday. <laughs> so she met her two heroes. Yeah, so I paid her way to go. Wow. And you know, for me, uh, that had no impact on my life, but for her, it was huge. And, you know, this is the gift all of us can give. For sure. And, uh, and it, sometimes it's just a smile to another person. But it can be so powerful. Similar, 
to Ruth, this woman in the magic shop. You can give a gift to somebody. And, so, you know, sometimes people will sit there and say, you know, I don't have resources. I don't have mm. time, et cetera, et cetera. All of us can do something every day to improve the life of another person. Yes. That's so powerful. That's so beautiful and so empowering. Absolutely. One thing I wanted to ask you, you also researched a lot on the blue zones, the blue zones and the reason for the longevity uh, of the people there. And one of the things is extremely fascinating is people not moving out of the, of the places they were born in because they don't have to create a projection of themselves and protect that projection as they move through life because everybody who's been there knows them since they were tiny kids running around. It's very interesting, but we have this trope these days. We have this, uh, you know, and even in popular culture, it reinforces that, that you have to move out and you have to, uh, to progress means to go out into the world. I mean, even, even songs like Thunder Road and Fast Car, they're all about leaving this town and getting somewhere. How do we balance these things? Well, it's really hard. Uh, um, the nature of modern society, uh, and the, in some ways, the way I use the word succeed, society or ha has succeeded is by moving out of the rural areas into concentration within cities. And as you point out, uh, in traditional uh, uh, how humans lived 100, 150, 200 years ago was in small groups of people, uh, usually over uh, under 150. Uh, everyone knew everyone. From the day you were born to the day you died, you were in the same village. And the thing is, though, the village loved you. Loved you. Everybody was there to help you be a better person. And so you weren't always anxious about, uh, again, you mentioned the word projection, projecting something that you're really not. You were who you are. You didn't have anxiety about it because you had people who cared about you, who gave you advice, who guided you. And uh, you were living in intergenerational families. Everybody knew everything about you pretty much. And fundamentally, no matter what you had done, you were still loved. Mm. And that's extraordinarily powerful. We know from the research you mentioned, and I didn't really do any of this research. This is research was done by Butner and Waldinger, uh, although he researched a group at Harvard for 80 years. But regardless, what the data shows is that the critical characteristics that increase longevity, while they're contributed to by diet, and there are a million Mediterranean diet books. Absolutely. Uh, while exercise is important, while eating or uh, drinking in moderation, not smoking, et cetera, by far, by far, by far and away, the most important characteristic is human connection and depth of relationships. That's why you see people, because some people will tout, well, you know, uh, look at this lady. She's 105 and she's a, a vegetarian. She exercises every day, et cetera, et cetera. And then he'll say, well, here's a man. He's well overweight. He doesn't exercise at all. He drinks whiskey every day and he smokes cigars and he's 105 too. And the, the thing is what they do have in common is they have this incredible depth of connection. Now, I'm not saying not to exercise or to – get intoxicated all the time. But what I'm saying is the biggest factor is connecting with other people and caring and having an open heart, being available, being non-judgmental. And, you know, especially among adolescents now, they're terrified of being judged by other people. You know, when you move to an area, especially in the modern world, you don't have siblings, you don't have necessarily friends in that area. So there's all this anxiety about being judged, sure. and it creates stress, uh, and it affects your life in a very negative way. You know, I give a lot of talks, and getting in front of an audience for many people is also terrifying because you're so afraid that you're going to be judged by other people. And the greatest gift that I was given was I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I, because I just don't care what people think. And I don't mean that in a negative way, that my ego is such. What I mean is if I'm centered in doing the right thing, it doesn't matter what anyone thinks. And frankly, if somebody criticizes you 
for shedding a tear, for your voice cracking. They're the problem, not you. Mm-hmm. You know, I give a lot of these talks, and um, you know, I have no problem with uh, uh, telling a story and, and me getting emotional. And of course, you can sense it. Uh, and what happens is every time that gives permission for everyone else in the audience to feel the depth of that story you're telling. And many of them will start crying. You know, I gave a talk one time, and I came off the stage, and there were about 250 people there. And a woman came up to me and said, you know, that was so moving, and it reminded me of X, Y, or Z. And she said, could I give you a hug? And I said, of course. So I hugged her. All 249 remaining people lined up, and I hugged every one of them. And for each of those people, giving them that gift of connecting with them, holding them for a second, giving them love, is really, really powerful. And you can see why somebody like Amma has all these people who just want to be in her presence because of the energy that she transmits to them, the sense of caring, love. And it's very powerful because it empowers them. It allows them to connect Mm -hmm. with the power they have within themselves to heal, to get over grief, to accept difficult times. Absolutely. That's so interesting. And you also mentioned that compassion and empathy are actually beneficial for um, for our survival in a way. You know, they have, they have benefits. They have physiological benefits. They have, of course, mental benefits. But do you think that's all there is, really? Is it is it just a survival tactic or is it coming from somewhere else? What is your personal take on this? You're, you're really putting me on the spot here. <laughs> Because now you're taking science and spirituality and trying to merge them together here. Um, well, um, first of all, let me just define the difference between compassion and empathy. So empathy is taking on the emotional state of another. And that has nothing to do with suffering, necessarily. You can have empathic joy, actually. Mm-hmm, sure. Compassion, of course, is very specifically related to suffering and this motivational desire to alleviate suffering. Um, but in the context of our evolution as a species, and this is where the science comes in, uh, uh, they're, they're incredibly critical, as I talked about earlier. Having compassion for your kin, your children, sure. uh, that's how your children survive. They cannot care for themselves. So you're rewarded by the gifts of uh, having a reward center that gets activated when you care, having your physiology positively affected when you care, and also being able to train your mind to be in that state all the time because it's a very calming state. You know, it's called the rest and digest system, right? Uh, so they're, they're critically important. Now, if you go back a millennia, if not millions of years, these uh, characteristics are critical to our survival. And what humans do is we are always trying to explain. So we create a narrative that explains what we are observing. And it may have no truth in reality. It may have no scientific basis, but the connections we've made or that story we've told is very powerful because it explains things to us. And when you have an explanation, it calms you. Sure, sure. Uh, So uh, if you look at all the religions in the world, it's hard to imagine, one, that there is one religion that's the perfect religion as a solution for everybody. Of course, we all know that's false. Absolutely. Every one of these religions, and this is what Karen Armstrong did. uh, You probably know she founded the Charter for Compassion. She won the TED Prize in 08. She got together with the major leading spiritual and religious leaders, and it was understood that the reality is every one of them is based on compassion and the golden rule, every one. And this is the nature of the experiential aspect of our humanity. And then we create stories that support the reality of that experience, which we ultimately, in in many cases, find to have a scientific basis. And as I was saying earlier, every elevated spiritual leader understands the nature of the dogma. While it's very powerful, the stories are incredibly powerful, they serve the purpose of connecting you actually with the physiology that's evolved and allowing it to be potentiated through these different practices 
so you get the maximal benefit as a human being, which is calmness, self-awareness, elevated consciousness, lack of fear, acceptance. And these are the key points that I think many of the spiritual practices uh, attempt to do. And the sad thing is, unfortunately, with religion, because humans are involved, they have manipulated it for their own purposes, whether it's for greed or ego, and they've oftentimes then created hate by creating a narrative that my religion is superior to your religion. My dogma is better than your dogma. Exactly. And the reality is all of us are frail, fragile human beings on this earth who generally try to do the best we can. I would suggest to you that at least 95% of people are good people who just want to improve their lives and be better people. And it's not to say that different people have different stages where they're at in this world and different situations that they may or may not be able to get to this next level. But the reality is everyone pretty much is a good person. And we have this small percentage of people driven by ego, by greed, uh, lack of awareness uh, that actually unfortunately contributes to a lot of the problems in this world. Absolutely. So how much time do we have, Karnakar? Are we done? We have 10 minutes. Okay. All right, damn it. We're <laughs> going to go for it. What's our next topic? Next is uh, Happy AI. I wanted to ask you about ah. I wanted to, uh, this app that uh, and using artificial intelligence. Because if uh, being a neurosurgeon and uh, dabbling in uh, the Center for Altruism and uh, all that wasn't enough, you're also an entrepreneur and very successful entrepreneur. And also you're at the bleeding edge of technology with AI and things like that. So and an author. <laughs> and an author, of course, a best-selling author yeah. whose uh, Mind Magic is already out, is it? No, it it's, comes out in May. So, mind Magic uh, comes out in uh, that's May. A whole, so. We can talk about that a little bit, too. Yeah, we'll talk uh, about Mind uh, Magic. We're uh, just supporting my ego here. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, well, so as we were just talking about mental health, unfortunately, especially with the pandemic and especially living in modern society, we have created so many situations where people are chronically stressed and anxious and depressed, and uh, it's having a huge negative impact. Uh, it's having a huge negative impact on the personal level in terms of relationships, uh, in terms of living in this world, and part of it, unfortunately, is, at least in the United States, there seems to be this narrative of the rugged individualist, sure, which is sure. a lie. Everybody's and, an island. Yes, and, uh, and, and therefore, if you fail, it's your own fault. Mm -hmm. And also that there's no need to have any sort of social support system. And as a result, we have a lot of unemployed people, a lot of people who are suffering. You know, we, ha we don't have a living wage. We have a minimum wage. And people are barely surviving. You know, the average person in the United States has less than $400 in case of an emergency, wow. which is shocking. Most people don't have any significant type of retirement plan. Yet, the reality is, if you look around the world, there's plenty available for everyone. But uh, um, getting back to Happy AI, if we look across the swath of people in the United States, as an example, 25% of people have no one to talk to when they're suffering or in pain. The average adult male has 0 0.6 friends. Wow. Uh, we talked about adolescents, 18 to 24, even younger. You know, they're locked into social media oftentimes, which is very unhealthy. They're being manipulated, and they feel like they have to perform or be perfect, which, of course, is not possible. We have uh, – they did a survey of high school students. Seventy-some percent wanted to be, quote-unquote, influencers. <laughs> if you look at the influencers, these are people who desperately want to be something that they're not oftentimes. So they use filters. They wear all this makeup. They create stages that make them look like they're living the luxury life. And deep down inside, though, they know that's not real. And so you have this constant conflict between who you are versus who you want to be to impress people to think you're, quote, unquote, successful and that you deserve admiration. And, it, and then, of course, that impacts the people who don't have self-knowledge about these things or self-awareness who want to be like these people. And, of course, they're never good enough, 
And that reinforces the, this negative dialogue that says, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not worthy. And that creates a huge circular type of uh, uh, mental health issue. The reality is, though, there are not enough therapists available to offer mental health services to everyone. There's a huge swath of the population that have absolutely no resources for any I've type. heard it uh, called a mental health pandemic. Yes, and uh, Vivek Murthy, who I've had the pleasure of being on programs with on youth mental health, um, uh, the U.S. Surgeon General, um, that's, that, that's his quote. So how can we deal with this? Right now, they're basically, I may get this, I think it's four uh, ways that there are apps to treat mental health, or they say they are. Uh, one of those ways is uh, meditation-type apps, mm -hmm. and the, he the major ones are Calm and Headspace. The reality is, even though both of them have signed up well over 100 million users, I used to be an advisor to Calm. Uh, in fact, there's a calm story by me. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> yes. What's it called? Uh, viewers might want to look it up. Uh, it's probably into the magic. It relates to the book, actually. Okay, great. But uh, anyway, they used to give my book to every new employee. Wow. And when they signed up the 10 millionth person, uh, I gave a talk at the, the party for that. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, these apps were, I mean, meditation apps were not necessarily meant for mental health. They can be helpful, mm. but... Uh, they are not meant specifically for that. Um, and if you look at the number of people using those apps, it's only two to four million a day. And they've signed up over 100, 150 million people. And it tells you it's not sticky at yeah. all. People use it and it doesn't help them. So then the next thing is online therapy. And online therapy certainly can be a benefit the problem is most people can't afford it. It's very expensive. And, you know, therapy typically is not, oh, I saw them two times and it's all over. This goes on for a long it's period a long of time. It's a long term, yeah. And, uh, uh, and what it is is actually con constant conversations to calm you down. Uh, then the next uh, iteration is um, chatbots. And these are uh, things like Wobot where you type in how you're feeling and then you get an answer back. The problem is there's no emotional connection. You're typing into the netherland. Yes, true. Uh, and, uh, and also there's no ability to understand valence. And what I mean by that is I could type I'm sad and I may be about to slip my wrist mm. while another person may type I'm sad and their coffee uh, uh, <laughs> wasn't the way they liked it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so there's not that ability to do. And while there is evidence it can be helpful, the most powerful thing, and we've talked about this some, is human connection. Now, I use the term human, and let me explain that a little bit. Uh, this connection with another entity that you feel relates to, that you can connect with, I'm sure many of the listeners have used virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And this is where you put the goggles on. And a classic thing that they do is take you from your carpeted room to put you on a plank overlooking an abyss. Mm. Now, on a cognitive level, you know you're not over an abyss. But if they ask you to jump off the plank, almost no one will do it. It's very scary. Yeah, yeah and the reason is it's hijacked you on a subconscious level. You cannot help but respond in that way. Well, what we've done is we've created a, what we call an emotion engine. And what we do is we interpret your emotional state while we converse with you. Mm -hmm. And that's through speech, it's through facial expressions, and it's through analyzing the context of your speech, okay? And it does it instantaneously. Wow. That is connected to a conversational AI knowledge base that is imbued with compassion-focused therapy and psychology, millions and millions of pages, interviews with people, then that's connected to a human-like avatar. And the reason I gave the story about the virtual reality is when you interact using the app, you are looking at another person. It's talking to you. It understands your emotional state. It responds 
to your emotional state. If it improves during the conversation it, or it's negative, it changes how it talks to you. And then you can either use it to simply have a conversation or you can ask it for advice. Mm -hmm. And whether it's, uh, should I try breathing exercise to calm myself down? Mm. Uh, what are other techniques I can use to calm myself down? And the thing is, because you fill out a profile, you use it, it learns about you, it becomes very connected mm. to you. So it customizes according to your profile over yes. time. Yes, yes. Wow. And so then you develop an emotional connection to it. And it is non-judgmental, it's compassionate, it is empathic, and it gives you good advice. But even if the user knows cognitively that this is, an, this is not a human, you, you think that will not? Uh... Oh, no. It's just like the virtual reality. Mm -hmm. You know you're not uh, on a plank overlooking abyss. You know this is not human. We mm -hmm. tell you it's not human. Yet you still respond to it on an emotional level as if it's humans. Now, I'm not advocating we uh, have you never interact with another human. You just act with the avatar. What this does, though, is we know through a conversation of typically 10 to 15 minutes that in most people who feel stressed and anxious suddenly, and it typically happens at night when you're not distracted, simply having a conversation dissipates most of those feelings over 10 to 15 minutes of conversation. And this is what happens if you have a friend or someone who is close to you sure. where you're troubled, you simply have a conversation with them. And that's really the power of this. And uh, uh, the other thing is because it's an avatar, you can actually uh, have choose one that you wish. Mm -hmm. So it may be a different sex or the same sex. It may be a different culture. It could be a different religion. It could be a different sexuality. Uh, and because when you find somebody that looks like you, acts like you, that you're comfortable with, that also sets the stage for you to have a positive response Absolutely. in that interaction. Plus, the avatar can speak 61 languages seamlessly. Wow. It sounds amazing. But of course, there must be a lot of control involved because the avatar, suppose it could access uh, data, suppose that was not kosher, that was not uh, verified. Sure. So. so you're right. And as you know, with ChatGPT and other forms of AI, they hallucinate. Yes, they get it wrong. Or lie. Yeah. Or there have been multiple cases where people have committed suicide based on what they told them. Really? Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Yes. So, uh, and in fact, I did a, <clears throat> I asked one uh, chat GP to do a bio of me, and it said, Dr. Doty has won 10 awards. Five of them were just completely made up. <laughs> but I still put them on my CV. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what we've done is, this is a constrained database that doesn't communicate with chat GPT. It wow. is its own knowledge base. So it will never hallucinate. It will not go rogue. It won't tell you to go commit suicide. And so it's very contained, and that's uh, what makes it very powerful. And in fact, uh, when individuals may uh, make statements that involve self-harm, it actually has a process of de-escalation. Wow. So it'll talk to you when you first state it. It'll say, I'm very concerned about you. What is making you feel this way? Why do you feel this way, et cetera? If you make another self-harm statement, it'll do the same thing. The third self-harm statement, it will say, listen, I'm very worried about you. You've really exceeded my capabilities to help you, but I think you really need to talk to somebody. I would like to dial a, a hotline for you and have you talk to somebody. So it has that escalation level yes. as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. This sounds amazing. Yeah. This so, sounds well, you know, we did a study, and it was half of them were adolescents. A third of them were... Um, actually poor people, adults, uh, and the remainder were uh, cancer patients or first responders. And we did a, uh, a survey uh, that covered stress, anxiety, and depression, and you rate it between one and five, one being normal, five extremely severe. And then we did pre and post. Over 70% of people in each category, after using it over uh, you know, at least a minimum of 10 minutes a day for seven days, seven days only, had over a 70% two-level improvement in their, compared to their pre-use uh, uh, Well, that's rating. really impressive. Yeah, and, really uh, and, and we actually thought it, it was wrong. But it shows you, again, the power of 
quote unquote, human connection. And even though we know it's false and we don't hide that, it is a method to offer you help and it's not meant to separate you from interaction with normal humans. What it does is it gives you the ability to calm yourself, to accept yourself so that you can actually interact with humans again. It's incredible. So it's available for users? Uh... Uh, it'll be launched in January, but if people go to the website HAPPI, and it's H-A-P-P-I dot A-I, uh, you can actually sign up, and we're actually uh, allowing people to sign up for free and use the app if they give us feedback before we launch, and we're hoping that to be in January of this year. So I'm very excited, and again, you know, I'm hopeful that this is something that can really benefit a lot of people. And the manner in which we priced it is such that it will allow almost everyone the ability uh, to use the app. That's incredible. That's incredible. Now, we have to bring this to a close before Karnakar drinks more caffeine yes. to keep his nerves. Uh... <laughs> I've, been, I've been hearing him over there gulping it down. <laughs> yeah, so lastly, just mind magic is on the horizon as well. You both. Yes. So let's just talk about that a bit. Sure. Uh, so um, in Into the Magic Shop, the first book, uh, and we were discussing it some, this idea of manifestation. And in fact, I told you that I really didn't quite understand it, and I had to learn that lesson later. Mind magic, in some ways, uh, is very much about that. Although it's, it's not my personal story in every aspect, it mentions that. But the reason I bring this up is, and there's a book that's been quite popular. It sold 37 million copies, which is called The Secret. I don't know if oh, you've yes, heard Oh, yes, Rhonda yeah. Byrne, yeah. Exactly. Hmm. The Secret is a book about I, I, I. Okay, And it, again, buys into this false narrative that if I just get this, my life is going to be better. And it's a completely false narrative, as is this idea of the law of attraction. Okay, My book is the antithesis of the secret. And it goes back to what I said earlier. Who we are as human beings, our possibilities to elevate ourselves, to reach this elevated height, and if you want to call it spirituality or whatever— relates to being of service to others. And that's what it's all about. Your manifestation is actually greatest when you look at how you see the world in a different way, where you sit there and you say, how can I be of, ser how can I be of service? How can I help? And, but you get all the other stuff hmm. if you want that at the end of the day. And it also under, makes you understand the nature of the power you have within yourself. You don't need to look outside of yourself. It's understanding yourself. It's understanding the power within yourself. It, under, it's, it allows you to understand how we as a species evolved and understand that the most powerful thing you have is within you. And when you can connect with that, everything changes. You can control your physiology. You can actually see how you can embed these things. And I go through these various brain networks. And I also show many examples, including Jim Carrey, who you may know. Yes, yes. And uh, it also offers you a six-week program. But this is about manifestation in service of a greater vision than yourself, which then allows you to get everything. It sounds amazing. It sounds amazing. Thank you, Dr. Dodi. It's been absolutely wonderful, and I'm sure our listeners would also benefit from this, uh, this beautiful sharing. And it's, uh, it's just amazing how that visit to the magic shop and that gift you got from Ruth, how you've just multiplied it over and over and, and continue doing it. And we're looking forward to mind magic. And Well, I, I would suggest, as I said before, everyone has the ability to improve the life of at least one person. Thank you. That's a beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into this episode of KanaCast. Please follow and subscribe to KanaCast on Spotify, YouTube, and Instagram. Until next time. Woof woof.